It's called like div five in computer science sometimes. Div five. That's a friend. Div five. Um, uh, and these are a Galois connection. It says that a is less five uh, a is less than b if and only if a is less than the floor of b over five. So that's a Galois connection. Um, there's something called closure. So that's, that's another example. So div 3 would be the left adjoint of multiplication by 3. Um, but there's lots of other adjoints. Um, for example, any closure operation gives you an adjunction or a Galois connection. So if you have, um, suppose you have a set, you're in computer science land, and you have a set of arithmetic expressions, P is the set of arithmetic expressions. So inside of P are things like 5 times 3 minus 2 plus 6. And the less than or equal to relationship here is not whether one number is bigger than another, but whether you can rewrite, um, can rewrite. If you can rewrite this to something, so you have some rewrite rules to say I can rewrite this to 15 minus 2 times 2 plus 6. And I can rewrite this to 5 times 3 minus 8. And I can rewrite both of these to um, 15 minus 8. And I can rewrite this one to 7. And so this is a Hasse diagram of arithmetic expressions. Um, there's a closure operation which says take any arithmetic expression and go to the furthest, evaluate it. Then you have what's called a normal form. Not all, in arithmetic expressions you can do that, but in some realms of computer science, there is no way of rewriting, of knowing, of decidedly knowing what something's normal form is. It may not have a normal form. But let's just say we're in this land, we have normal forms. And a closure operation is something that takes, it's a map from P to P, closure. It takes every element of P and returns an element of P such that P is less than or equal to the closure of P. So it's a rewrite. P rewrites the closure of P. But the closure of the closure of P is less than the closure of P. There's a lot of words there. So it says if you rewrite, if you take this thing, you get 7. And if you rewrite 7, you get 7 again. And every time you have a closure operation, which happens all over the place in computer science, um, you get something called, you get an adjunction. And the adjunction is p to the fixed point of the closure operation. So all the, all the um, numbers would be, would be a post set. It would actually be a discrete post set. And all the arithmetic expressions would be a post set. And you could take anything and like close it up, take the fixed points. Or you could go back and take every fixed point and just realize it as an element of the set. And somehow you can check that these are a junction. So closure operations always give you adjunctions. Um, adjunctions kind of come up all over the place, like free groups in group theory, or free rings, or polynomial rings, or vector spaces. All of these things are come, have adjunctions associated with them. And so we'll be getting to that um, later. So I'll give it back to Brendan. Hmm? Yeah. So <coughs> that was cool. Um, <laughs> one thing we wanted to do was just get a sense of why everyone is here and what you expect or want to get out of this course. Um, so perhaps maybe I'll give you three to five minutes to discuss, talk with your neighbors for a bit, and then I'll. Of what the room was thinking. He's being hesitant because I was supposed to do that. <laughs> um, so yeah, talk to your neighbor and just tell each other like why you're here, what you hope to get out of it, and um, and then you'll tell us when you're done. You'll tell us you the answer you. when when <laughs> Brendan tells you. <laughs> Thank you.
Say a few words just to give us a sense of what people expect. Um, so, okay, there we so are. sorry, it wasn't my idea, but but um, I heard discuss like sort of a desire to see the application of the category theory. Right. It gave okay. it some some utility. Right. So maybe we'll try and talk a bit about that. Yep. I suspect a lot of us are looking to draw connections between category theory and whatever field. We're right. personally studying. Okay, so that's it might be type theory. It's type theory for you. Um, what other fields are people studying? Cryptography and theoretical CS. Uh -huh. uh, is CS representative, or most people are on the CS sort of side? Anyone else? Engineering, math. What did you say? I'm, I'm an electrical, but I don't see this as applying to work. I just want to be able to think more clearly, and this sounded like interesting stuff. Cool. Cool. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so is that a strong motivation? Would you like us to focus more on the category theory than on the, like what's the balance between category theory and applications? You can also tell us afterwards. Like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. 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 Applications. <laughs> applications. Applications. Okay. That's really clear. Both. <laughs> Both. Cool. Okay. Well. Let me describe what's in what we're <coughs> planning, and then we'll, we'll tweak it according to how it goes. Um, so, the point of today's lecture was really to to at least give something that you can come back to um, if if it gets very abstract. Uh, so, so on Thursday, I'm gonna uh, talk a bit about some. 
some work done by, by David and Ryan a few years ago that has led to a startup that Ryan is leading called Category Informatics about databases. Um, so the problem is uh, there's a lot of data and we need to structure it well. Um, and when you have a bunch of data structured in various ways, you also want to do sort of certain transformations to it. You, you have some sort of, you have databases, you want to merge them, you want to relabel things, uh, you want to search over them. And you want to do this in a, a structured way, so you know that <coughs> things are not going to break. Um, so to give you a sense of, of what a database looks like, um, say we have, it's really just a bunch of tables. So we have, um, say, a database of students at MIT, and they might have some sort of ID, I don't know, an ID number, um, they have an identity, they have a Kerberos identity, they have a name, they have a major, uh, uh, and so forth. Um, and then we might have another table linked to major or department where we have sort of, I don't know, the major is, has a certain name, um, so I don't know, of course 18 I think is math. Um, and, <laughs> oh, that's true. And <laughs> it's based in uh, building two or something like that, right? So we have, I don't know, we have David from the instrument, David, uh, he's like D sphere back or something, um, and you might major in math. Um, and so on. Uh, so <coughs> what we're going to see is that the, the way a database is structured, so a database schema, is an example um, of a very finite example of a category. And then instances of databases become certain functors. So a functor is, is a map between categories that preserves, preserves the structure, the, the compositional structure of a category. So it's, in fact, <coughs> just a direct generalization of a mono monotone map. Um, so a, a post set is a particularly simple sort of category, and a monotone map is a particular, particularly simple sort of functor. So we'll understand databases, database schemas as categories, database instances or databases as functors to a special category called the category of sets. Um, and so functors to the category of sets are known as pre sheaves And then we're going to understand certain da database operations as, uh, as arising from limits or co-limits or kind extensions or adjunctions. Uh, so in particular, an adjunction is, uh, as David said, uh, the, the generalization into the categorical setting of this notion of Galois connection. So, uh, this a little slow. I'm a little slow. Yeah, okay, so this Galois connection <laughs> is quite a simple condition. It just says, uh, well, that this is true if this is true. Um, and we sort of certify that and and it becomes some sort of isomorphism between two sets of relationships. Uh, so that's databases. Then we'll talk about uh, resource theories. Um, so that's really to introduce more basic category concepts. Uh, a resource theory in our setting is, um, is, it begins as a type of post set with additional structure. So um, the point is that if, if so, I say um, I'm cooking something, I have all these sort of operations that I can do that sort of take resources and turn into resources. So I might have, say, bake, and it takes an oven and some batter, and we get a delicious cake, um, and we still have our oven at the end. So you might have this <laughs> as some sort of uh, order, order relationship that says from batter and oven, we can go to cake and oven. Um, but well, one additional structure we need here is to be able to talk about combinations of, of objects or elements. Uh, so batter and oven, not just batter or oven, right? Or not, not just an individual one. And so this, this sort of combination structure is known as a monoid, um, and we'll talk about monoidal posets. Um, and then we also want to introduce notions. So, so this can help we have, if I'm a book, I have a library of these operations that I can do, and I want to answer questions like, uh, with these resources, with these ingredients, what can I make? Um, but uh, we want to introduce, um, you might want to answer other questions like uh, how much does it cost to make something or uh, what are the, what's the set of ways in which I can make something. Um, and we're going to use this as a, as a way to introduce the notion of an enriched category. So to vary the notion of, it's a way of varying the notion of relationship. Um, so 
here, for post sets, the notion of relationship was just this Boolean value that said yes or no. For a, for a category, it's a whole set of, of ways to relate. And there's a powerful theory of being able to vary your notions of relationship to get things also like metric spaces. Um, after that, I want to talk about signal flow for us. Um, so here we're going to categorize linear algebra. Um, so it's long been known to engineers, um, at least since Shannon, that we can do this thing, do this thing called draw signal flow graphs. Um, so for example, the, the idea being, if I have two inputs, um, I might want to sort of spit an input and then amplify this, uh, maybe amplify this, and then add them, and, and so on. And this sort of represents some sort of transformation from a signal, two signals, two values that can put in here to two values that come out. Um, and what we will see is that this is a formal depiction, I mean, this is long, long we know, this is a formal depiction of some sort of matrix that says, uh, we put this value straight here, so we get sort of 1, 0, um, 4, 5. Right. So th this, is, this is the way that this diagram <coughs> transforms our signal by this matrix. Um, now, what we want to do is interpret these diagrams as morphisms in a particular sort of category which, which generalizes the monoidal post-set, so it's called a monoidal category. Um, and this will allow us to, say, start drawing, to generalize linear algebra uh, by drawing machines that, for example, if I, I start to feed in something backwards through here, this is not a great operation you can do with matrices, but it's something you can do with flow graphs. Um, and then I want to talk about giving a presentation of this category. So to give a, a sound and complete logic for reasoning about these diagrams, and then come back to the engineering setting by showing that certain diagrams have, uh, diagrams of certain forms have good semantic properties. So we'll, we'll generalize this, still maintaining our nice form properties, to talk about linear dynamical, linear time invariant dynamical systems, uh, and then show that we can reason about controllability in this categorical setting. Uh, in, in the fifth lecture, uh, we want to talk about collaborative design or co-design. Uh, so this is some work also done here by, by David and collaborators um, on very intensity. Uh, and the idea is to come sort of back to this setting, but say uh, we say we're designing some sort of motor, and we have so we have uh, some engine, and it has certain uh, it can offer certain functionalities uh, and has certain requirements to offer those functionalities. So for example, there's a cost to it, uh, it needs energy to run, or power, um, but it, it can bear a certain load um, and transport it at a certain, uh, let's say, velocity, although that's not quite accurate. Um, now, now, so we're interested, well, we might have a battery, say, and we want to interconnect these things and see what we can build, but we're not interested in these things abstractly as sort of individual uh, sort of, we're not interested in whether it has a cost, we're interested in what the cost is. So we need to start structuring what are the objects in our category. And so this is going to be a way to talk about uh, categories.